Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started in um, just a minute. We appreciate you being here. So I see that it is actually just after one, uh, 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to get started. Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, November 2nd, and it is the start of our new fall 2021 Implementation Science Seminar Series. And for people who um, may have participated in our seminars from uh, psychiatry and human behavior over the last three years, you will see that this is a little different. So with the renewal of the advanced CTR, um, our implementation science seminar series, which have been run out of the implementation science core of the uh, Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior, we are now co-hosting these sessions with uh, advanced CTR, where I am now serving as co-director for implementation science in the in one of the cores of advanced CTR, and then also with the Brown Arch, the Alcohol and Research Center for HIV out of the Brown School of Public Health. So we're having a three-way um, uh, implementation science seminar series. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Unlike previous years, we're doing these uh, seminars for, the, for six weeks in a row. We've usually scattered them across the semester and so we're starting today with the first one and then moving through to December 7th. And we hope you can join us each Tuesday from 10 to 11 a.m. For people who may not be able to join every Tuesday, these will be recorded and you will be able to uh, view these on uh, the advanced CTR website. Um, at any point that you have questions, please put questions in the chat and we will monitor the chat and uh, we'll do questions at the end. Uh, for people who've heard me say this before, I can't see very many people when I'm giving a presentation. So um, unless you have something that's really, really urgent, um, please just put the question in the chat. But if you do have an urgent question, a clarifying question, I don't have any problem with you unmuting yourself and asking the question right there and then. Okay. So good morning, everyone. I'm Ronnie Elwi. Um, I am an associate professor of psychiatry and human behavior in also behavioral and social sciences at, at Brown University. And I'm launching um, this uh, fall 2021 series with a talk on sustainability. Um, as I just explained, we're moving our implementation science seminars from our implementation science core hosted in psychiatry and human behavior. We still have this site, so you're welcome to go to it to see some of the past um, trainings that we've done. And also we will put more information here um, about future trainings. But we are now doing these in conjunction with Advanced CTR where you registered for this and the Brown um, Arch, the Alcohol Research Center on HIV. So it's really exciting to grow in capacity with our implementation science seminars for this term and beyond. Because some people might be joining us for the first time, we've been, we've been running these implementation science seminars for the last um, three years, but some people might be new to them. So I wanted to start with um, definitions. So when I think of implementation science, I think of the scientific study of methods to promote the systematic uptake of research findings and other evidence-based practices into routine practice, and hence to improve the quality and effectiveness of health services. And, this comes from a publication by our colleague, Mark Bauer and others um, from 2015. And when often we talk about implementation science, we often say dissemination and implementation or DNI. I won't be talking that much about dissemination today, but just so that we have a definition. Um, I, dissemination I think of as an active approach of spreading evidence-based interventions to the target audience via determined channels using, using specific strategies. And this is from a book um, co-edited by Ross Brownson, um, uh, uh, Graham Kolditz, and Enola Proctor, and that's a book from 2018. And when we think of implementation science, I think of them in these sort of big buckets, concepts of like we, and, and very familiar to people who have been working in research for a while, we always have research questions. They're always guided by theories, models, and frameworks, and there's always a corresponding study design. But what's often unique about dissemination and implementation science projects is that 
We also are thinking of what are our implementation strategies to get our evidence-based practices into use, and then also the, um, the examination of implementation outcomes. So those are two new things that can be added on to um, existing types of research questions that you already are addressing. So today we're focusing specifically on sustainability. And I really like to talk about sustainability as planning for sustainability. None of us ever knows if the evidence that we're trying to get into practice is actually going to be, well, first of all, we don't even know if it's going to work. And so oftentimes people have a concern about thinking about sustainability because they're like, well, how should I think about sustainability when I don't even know, does my, is, there, is my evidence-based practice effective? Can I get it implemented? But what a lot of people would say, and especially David Chambers, who's done a lot of work in this area, is that if you don't plan for sustainability, it certainly will not happen. And so what we'll be talking about today is this notion of planning for sustainability and how do we do that? And this is a table from this paper by uh, David Chambers and colleagues from Implementation Science back in 2013. And I want to share it here to just to really think about like, what do we mean by sustainability and, and what do we mean by sustainment? Because these are, these are two different terms. They are often used interchangeably. And I certainly am one of those people who does use them interchangeably, although you can see here that they are technically different terms. So when we think about sustainability, it's the extent to which an evidence-based intervention can deliver its intended benefits over an extended period of time after external support from a funding agency is terminated. So, you know, after you no longer have your research funds, does that evidence-based practice, the evidence-based intervention continue? That would be the definitions of sustainability. Sustainment is the continued use of an intervention within practice. And I think that's a very nuanced difference. And so as a result, people do use these terms interchangeably. I'm going to mostly use the term sustainability, although if I move into sustainment, it's not because I'm trying to be confusing. It's just, it's hard to keep those terms separate. And when we think of implementation science study designs, um, one design that is very unique to implementation science was actually created within the field of implementation science are these hybrid designs, these hybrid effectiveness implementation randomized control trials. And Dr. Sarah Becker will be talking specifically about hybrid designs in a couple of weeks, so you'll hear a lot more about this then. But I'm going to be talking about specifically the hybrid type three design within the context of how do you plan for sustainability. So I'm not going to be giving you a lot of details on how you do a hybrid design that will come in a few weeks. But I want to bring in this here, one, because it's an example that I'm working in. But really, these are a continuum, as you can see, from a hybrid type one um, effectiveness implementation trial, which is really, honestly, it's a typical randomized controlled trial your primary aim is on effectiveness and your aim three is collecting some implementation context data along the way that can help you help inform your next study. Your hybrid two is a really challenging type of study where you have two co-primary aims. One is on the effectiveness of your evidence-based practice. The other one is on the effectiveness of your implementation strategy to increase the uptake of your evidence-based practice. So you're kind of doing two studies in one. And then in your hybrid three, which is the one that I'm going to be focusing on more today, is the one where your primary aim is on the effectiveness of your implementation strategies. You want to know how well your implementation strategies perform in increasing the uptake adoption of your evidence-based practice. And you keep your eye on your effectiveness aim as a secondary aim or a tertiary aim in order to understand even when you take an effective evidence-based practice and move it maybe into a different context or are using different strategies, does it still work? So it's in this context that I'm going to be talking about sustainability um, in terms of this sort of like more along the pipeline type of study. Before I move into some examples of how you use that hybrid three, I just wanna point out that there are a lot of existing um, frameworks, models and theories within implementation science that are starting to incorporate more of sustainability into them. So for example, the RE-AIM framework, um, the REACH Effectiveness Adoption Implementation Maintenance Framework, which has been around for I think for about 21 or 22 years now, is starting to think more about how do you add sustainability. The maintenance aspect, the M in RE-AIM, is really on does 
this intervention effect last over time in terms of both individuals involved as well as the organizational setting. And you can actually start to think about that from a sustainability perspective. Um, up here, I have a new logo for Reaim. Actually, the Reaim website is getting um, revamped, and I think it's this Thursday. If you go to the reaim.org website here, you can actually register for um, a seminar on Thursday where they will walk you through the new Reaim website, and um, they will talk about what, what's new and also probably more about how Reaim is thinking about sustainability, which is one of the main issues really that we are talking about in implementation science these days. So that you will no longer see this logo on the left, it is now this logo on the right. And Rachel Shelton, David Chambers and Russ Glasgow, Russ Glasgow is the originator of the REAIM framework, have been thinking about how you can use REAIM to enhance sustainability. And so this is a new figure that they have created with this continuous focus of sustainability around the outset of this. Uh, you know, addressing these in the green are the original re-aim concepts of reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. And you can see here for maintenance, they now have said maintenance slash sustainability. And then throughout the impl pre-implementation, implementation, and sustainment phases, really trying to think about what are the types of issues that we need to be talking about. And so some very specific sustainability considerations within re-aim and in this extension of re-aim is to think about not just who the evidence-based intervention reaches, that, that would be what we think about when we think about the original re-aim concepts in the green, but now it's who isn't reached by the evidence-based intervention? Who are we missing and, and why is that? Another sustainability question um, from the re-aim framework is, does the evidence-based intervention continue to be effective over various points in time? And so we now realize that it's not just is something effective immediately or in the short term after we've done our research, but how can we continue something over a much longer period of time? And, and that um, is part of the effectiveness piece of the original re-aim. And then another sustainability consideration is which settings or staff continue to deliver the evidence-based intervention over time? Again, thinking about adoption and thinking about not just at one point in time or a couple points in time, but how can we really think about this over a much longer um, period of time. Um, in the work that I've been doing in the VA, this is something I've been doing over the last nine years where we move from true health services research where we're developing an evidence base for communication for when things go wrong in healthcare, what we call large scale adverse events, to the implementation and testing of a, of a, a disclosure toolkit that we developed to then sustaining that disclosure toolkit in, in the form of a disclosure support program, which is actually a facilitation and coaching um, strategy that we use. So from these stages of evidence generating to implementation testing to sustainment, we've actually used the CFER in this work. And so this isn't something I've seen a lot of, but I think it can be really useful in that when you think about the consolidated framework for implementation research, we tend to think of this as implementation determinants, sort of the barriers. What are the barriers and potentially the facilitators to our uh, the adoption, the implementation of our evidence-based practice? And we think of them in these five domains of characteristics of the intervention itself, the inner setting context, the outer setting context, the individuals involved in the implementation process. But in our work, thinking and planning for sustainability over those nine years is we've really used the implementation process domain as a step-by-step -step process to increase that sustainability. So how did we plan for this work with our stakeholders? How did we engage them in that process? What did we do to execute the implementation and then the follow-up sustainment work? And then a lot of repeating and reflecting and evaluating of what we've done along the way. So this isn't a linear process by any means. We might plan, we might reflect and evaluate, we might engage, we might reflect and evaluate, and then we'll execute and reflect and evaluate. So it's certainly wasn't something that happened overnight. It took, it took a lot of years to actually make this part of VA practice. We're now, our disclosure support program is actually part of a VHA directive. We are actually part of a standard operating procedure. And in government speak, this is actually a big deal, but it took a lot of years. And I would say that this CFER domain of the implementation process really helped 
with our um, focus and planning for sustainability. Another framework that really emphasizes sustainment is the EPIS framework by Greg Ahrens and colleague. And EPIS, as you see here, stands for Exploration, Preparation, Implementation, and Sustainment. And obviously there is a sustainment term in here, so you can see how that is related. And you know, a lot of these frameworks are, you know, they have an inner context that you just saw that in CIFR, you saw the outer context in CIFR. Um, innovation factors is um, in this EPIS framework, innovation is also in other frameworks such as iParis, but in here, we're really thinking about the linkages and the interconnections between um, the innovation and the bridging factors in these different steps along the way. And so exploration is more of a pre-implementation with preparation, then there's implementation and sustainment as sort of a, a, a lasting framework. But you can learn a lot about this framework at this um, website here at this framework.com. And so finally, I'm going to move into the dynamic sustainability framework. And this is what I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of the talk. And um, this is something that we're using in a VA implementation science uh, program of uh, that consists of three hybrid type three trials. And the reason why is because one, as part of our implementation science program, we really need to be thinking about sustainability. So it isn't any longer, does something work? We know that something works. It's even not even longer, can we get something implemented and adopted? We know that we can. Now our questions are, how can we sustain what we know works in settings where there aren't a lot of resources? And so we decided that the dynamic sustainability framework by uh, Chambers, Glasgow and Stange was really the best model for our work. And if you've ever attended any theory or model or framework um, discussions in implementation science, um, one of my favorite quotes is from Laura Damschroder who created the, the CIFR and, and she says, there isn't anything that could be called a bad or wrong theory model or framework, but there are just ones that are better fitting. And I would say that in the context of the work that we are doing, we felt that the dynamic sustainability framework was a better fitting um, model for what we're doing. And in, in here, what we're looking at are these three components. One is the intervention itself. One is the practice setting or the context in which we are doing the implementation. And the third is the ecological system, which is really that outer setting of like everything else that's happening around in that world and how that's impacting what we're doing. And so the reason we really like this is you can see the T0, the T1, the TN in each of these, and then this arrow that says fit. And so we're constantly trying to think of how does our intervention fit with our practice setting, our context, and how does that fit within the ecological system in which we are working? And not just once, but how over time at that T0, that T1, and that T endpoint, really emphasizing that this is a con constant and, and continuous process of assessing that fit. And so this is the table that I showed you earlier, and I just wanted to point out the two things that are really the challenge to sustainability in almost anything that you do. One is voltage drop, and one is program drift. So you might think that you've gotten to the point where, great, you know, the people really like the evidence-based practice that I'm trying to implement, and they're really excited about doing it. But when you think about what is going to happen over the long term, these are the, these are the two things that should keep you up at night. And in fact, we were just talking about this in a, another project: is the voltage drop and the program drop. The, the voltage drop is when, over time, the intervention starts to yield lower benefits because perhaps it's just not being used at the same intensity as it was being done during your study. And so it, if something needed to be happening, you know, 10 times over five weeks, it just, people are no longer doing that. And so there's starting to be a voltage drop. And so the effectiveness of that intervention might decrease because it's actually not being delivered as intended. The other problem with sustainability is that program drift where you might, people might be thinking about, you know, this, there's this intervention, this evidence-based intervention, and it has this goal or these two goals, but over time, it might start to take on other roles. So for example, we were just talking about in a PORI project that we're working on that a, a, a potential program diff may be, we were doing a certain intervention to encourage a conversation about treatment between doctor and patient. 
but a potential program drift could be over time that the clinics start to use this ability to have this conversation as a way of billing for more uh, reimbursement, meeting, meeting certain standards, but they're not actually using the conversation to engage in treatment. And so the program is drifting to more of a reimbursement issue as opposed to actually a treatment um, engagement issue. And so that is something that we're keeping our eye on and, and, and certainly should be concerned about. So in terms of how to use the dynamic sustainability framework in, in real life, this is um, sort of a snapshot of what we're doing in our VA uh, uh, implementation science program, which is called uh, Bridge Query. Bridge is an acronym sort of for bridging the care continuum for vulnerable veterans over time. And in this case, <clears throat> excuse me, veterans in this case are those people who um, have mental health and substance use disorders and are most impacted by social determinants of health. And we are trying to implement three different evidence-based practices, each one in six unique settings. And each one of these is a separate practice, but geared to improving the uptake of mental health and substance use treatment. That's the EB1, EB2, and EB3. And I won't go into details about that right now, but those three practices are being implemented in a hybrid type three design in, in six different sites. So 18 sites total for the entire program. And this is funded by Query, which in the VA is our implementation science arm of research and development. Query stands for Quality Enhancement Research Initiative. To support these three um, hybrid three trials, we have an implementation core, which is helping to, um, with the methodologies across each of these three projects. Um, we have a rapid response team that is responding to national program office requests. We have a mentoring core to build up implementation science within our early career investigators so that we have um, a pipeline of implementation scientists coming into our programs. Those are the things that I'm in charge of. You can see with the arrow. And then each of these um, hybrid type three trials has a separate PI. And in each of these projects, we're using one of two implementation strategies. Each of these hybrid Type threes is a stepped wedge cluster randomized design where these six sites start two sites in each wedge and they start with a lower intensity, the bottom row, education outreach slash academic detailing strategy. We do that for six months. These are structured visits by trained personnel to the healthcare practices. A lot of this is now moved virtual, delivering tailored training and technical assistance to help them understand how they actually put that evidence-based practice related to mental health or substance use treatment into practice in this setting. And then at, we have a, a slight washout period and then we move to our higher intensity strategy of facilitation. And if anyone's ever been involved in facilitation, facilitation sounds like one strategy, but it's actually a host of a whole bunch of strategies of um, engaging stakeholders, identifying champions, action planning, staff training, problem solving, technical support, audit and feedback, and other things. And so we're, we're goal of our projects are to find out, you know, what are our implementation outcomes as a result of each of these types of strategies, and as well as what are our effectiveness outcomes. In addition to being guided by the dynamic sustainability framework to think about sustainability throughout this process, we're also um, using the query implementation roadmap to gauge how we do these different types of activities over these three phases of the project. So we start with a pre-implementation phase. Even though we know that these evidence-based practices work, we still want to find out what are the potential challenges um, to implementing these in new settings. Because we're a lot of the settings that we're, we're implementing, these are not necessarily hospital-based clinics. They are community-based clinics and so they have a lot fewer resources than the res from the clinics that we're used to working in. Then we have an implementation phase where we're really um, rolling out our strategies in that stepped wedge cluster randomized control design. And then we have a sustainment period because the whole goal is to see how can we actually sustain these, these mental health substance use treatment evidence-based practices over time. So this is how it looks from a, a roadmap phase of pre-implementation, implementation, and sustainability. And then here are the different activities that we are engaged in. So in pre-implementation, a lot of formative quality, qualitative interviews with key informants, 
process mapping of the workflow, and then baseline assessment of implementation outcomes such as acceptability, appropriateness, feasibility, organizational readiness. Then we do our implementation, which is the rollout of the different strategies um, in that stepped wedge cluster randomized control design. And we will be keeping our eye on a lot of effectiveness outcomes during that time. And then on sustainability, which is really what I'm gonna be focusing on is we still want to look at what are the remaining barriers in the pre-implementation phase, we're really looking at those proctor implementation outcomes of acceptability, appropriateness, feasibility, also this organizational readiness. Do they still exist when we're, when we're at this phase of sustainability? And if so, what do we do about that? Costs are a big thing because even in a healthcare system that isn't actually you know, charging um, uh, veteran patients for the care that they receive, we still have to provide a lot of services at a cost to our healthcare system. And so we need to think about that. That's always going to be one of the biggest challenges. And that's really more of thinking about the ecological system of the dynamic sustainability framework. And then I'm going to talk about two different types of measures that we are using to get at sustainability specifically, um, sustainment measurement system scale and the provider report of sustainment scale, both of which are relatively new. So first, how do we assess fit according to the dynamic sustainability framework, and I'm going to focus on what we're doing at the intervention and practice setting levels. So I mentioned that we're assessing at baseline, and then we will do it again after the first wedge of the implementation strategy of the educational strategy, and then we'll do it again after the high intensity strategies. We're using the, um, the Brian Weiner, Kara Lewis at Al measures of acceptability of in implementation measure, the intervention appropriateness measure, the feasibility of, of intervention measure. And we also have the Chris Shea and Brian Weiner measure of organizational readiness for implementing change. This is a 12 items. Each of these is four items, so it's 24 items total. We don't think it's high burden. We're really into the pragmatic types of measures so that we don't take up a lot of uh, very busy people's time. This is just a, a, a sort of, this is a false snapshot of a, of a implementation dashboard that we've created in our implementation core. This is not actual real data. We just put this in so that we could show other people what it is, but we are going to be able to look at these three measures over time at, at the pre-implementation stage, at the implementation stage, and at the sustainment stage to be able to see how is our intervention fitting. Um, and so these are, you know, measures specifically about the intervention, the acceptability, the appropriateness and feasibility. So of each of those specific three evidence-based practices. So we'll get a sense of how our intervention is fitting over time. And then in terms of the practice setting and the context, that's what we're getting at with the organizational readiness for implementing change. How is that practice changing or not changing over time in terms of being ready to implement that evidence-based practice? at the pre-implementation, implementation, and sustainment phases. So we will have three different time points for each of these across those three projects and each of them at six different sites. So that's how we're using the dynamic sustainability framework to really assess fit with the intervention and the practice setting. Of course, we're also still looking at effectiveness outcomes because that's still part of a hybrid type three design. So even though the main focus, the primary focus is on implementation, we have to keep our eye on effectiveness. So we are looking at these different types of effectiveness outcomes at baseline, pre-implementation, at the implementation stage, and then also at sustainment. So really things that we can get mostly, although some of them, this one, for example, on, um, on overdose knowledge, we have to do that with a survey, but most of these we can do with um, the databases that we have in the VA. And then in terms of, terms of assessing fit with a dynamic sustainability framework in that third component of ecological system, this is where we're really thinking about the costs. What are the costs that we are incurring from an implementation perspective and how should we be, how can we help the VA think about that um, after we are done with our trials so that they can decide if they can incorporate these or not into their mission. And here we're using the stages of implementation completion. And I don't know if people are familiar with this checklist, but it's really helpful because it breaks the process of, sustain of, of implementation into eight specific stages across three phases, which 
actually those three phases are the same as in the query implementation roadmap of pre-implementation, implementation, and sustainment. And then this, this SIC, it, I don't really like the acronym, but it's really important to know it because we often talk about the stages of implementation completion as the SIC. The SIC is also, it's been created by Lisa Saldana and colleagues in Oregon, and they've also used it importantly to think of the cost of implementing new strategies. And that's how we're using it. We're using it both as a way of thinking about what were our stages of implementation in these three projects, but how can we then attribute those different stages and those activities that we did into the specific costs that were incurred. So this is from their website, and you can see that these first three, um, the engagement, the feasibility, and the readiness planning, this is pre-implementation. Implementation starts with stage four, where staff are hired and trained, there's fidelity monitoring, there's consultation and ongoing services. Those four steps are uh, the implementation um, uh, phase. And then sustainability is really when you think about competency, assuming that if there's competency by the people who are at the sites who are delivering these evidence-based practices, evidence-based treatment, that then this can lead us to future sustainment. So what we do for each of the six sites for each of the trials, so 18 sites total, we are working with our teams to be able to think about what are the very specific engagement activities that we did to, to bring those sites on board and to help them make decisions about engaging with us in our, in our projects. Some um, work that we're doing to increase the feasibility of using that, implement, uh, using that evidence-based practice at these sites and what were the readiness and planning activities that we needed to do. So how did we prepare the sites? How did we collaborate with them? So for some of them, there was a lot of stakeholder engagement. There may be some official things like advisory boards. Other ones are just one-on-one. -on -one. But we are literally, we have Excel spreadsheets and we are literally marking who does what, where, and when for each of these stages. So we have the pre-implementation done. And, and then what we can say is that one person in particular worked with this one site this week for two hours or three hours or whatever it is. And we can then allocate an approximate cost for that hourly time and then multiply it by three if it was three hours. It's that detail, it's that, those are the ways that we are actually getting at the costs involved. And then we're doing it now for the implementation phases. So staff hired and trained, two out of our three interventions use peer support specialists who needed to be hired by the sites. They needed to be trained in our implementation efforts. Um, and then we have to develop fidelity monitoring systems, and then we have to have, provide ongoing consultation, and that's a lot where our implementation strategies come in, of either the educational strategies or the facilitation strategies. So we are marking how much time any single person spends working on this, these projects with each site in order to be able to come up with hourly costs for that. And we will continue to do so, so that we will be able to say, this is how much it would cost for an additional site to have to, in, to engage in this type of evidence-based practice. Hopefully if you can show that there's some cost benefit to this, that that would then increase uh, the ability for this to be sustained, not just at this site, but then also maybe at other sites as well. And then in terms of assessing fit over time, that T1, that T0, T1 and TN and the dynamic sustainability framework, how can we actually get at sustainment measurement, not just acceptability and feasibility, not just um, organizational readiness for change, but how can we actually measure sustainability? And this has been a really challenging place to be at, but at the same time, it's also a place where a lot of very smart people are working. And for that, it's thrilling to sort of, you know, be constantly looking in the literature and seeing that a new measure is coming out and then thinking about how we might incorporate it into our work. So this measure came out last year by Larry Palinkas and colleagues, the Sustainment Measurement System Scale. And I was really excited about this because prior to this, we were using um, something, and which I'll tell you about in a minute, called the Program Sustainability Assessment Tool. And I, and I really liked this tool. It was also a survey measure, but it, it kind of felt like I didn't know what the outcome of that sustainment was. So it, it sort of gave me like the sustainability determinants but not so much of a sustainment out, outcome to measure. And so here in the sustainment measurement system scale, 
we have that outcome. So this is the four item sustainment indicator or outcome global measure that is part of the scale. And so it, this is sort of your dependent variable. This is the kind of thing that you can use to see like what can predict the answers to this. And so this is a four item measure with Likert um, scales ranging from one to not, one meaning not at all, to five meaning all the time. And so these items are the, the project, the evidence-based practice um, that you're using continues to operate as described in the original application for funding. The project, the evidence-based practice continues to deliver prevention services to its intended population. And I should just back up and say that this was developed in the context of many SAMHSA grants. So they were focused on prevention. The project continues to deliver services that are evidence-based and the project periodically measures the fidelity of the services that are delivered. So that's the kind of outcome global measure that, that we were really looking for in, in how to assess sustainment. And then the other part of the sustainment measurement system scale is that there are these eight determinant factors. So sort of like CFER, Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, there are all these different implementation determinants you look at. These are now the sustainment determinants. And I can go into more details if people are interested in this, but I highly recommend going to Larry's paper as well, that these are the eight areas and each one of these areas has um, different um, survey items in this. So the entire survey is 35 items, including the four items for the global measure. And each of the survey items respond or are in one of these domains of funding and financial support, responsiveness to community needs, responsiveness responsiveness to community values, coalitions, partnerships, and networks, organization capacity to support sustainment, organizational staff capacity to um, support sustainment, so different from the organization, but also the staff, implementation leadership, and evaluation, feedback, and evidence of positive outcomes. So each of these determinants then can be predictive of this overall four item sustainment outcome global measure. And that's what we really liked about this. And so this just came out last year and our team decided to move from the program sustainability assessment tool, which I will tell you about, which has actually been really useful for conversations, but we feel like this is going to be a more useful measure for us over time. So we will be able to use this after the first wave of implementation strategies, the educational strategies, and then that's at the implementation phase. And then after the second wave of the higher intensity facilitation strategies, we'll use it again. And then we can use it again at the end of our program to really understand how we are moving towards sustainment in which of these factors may be predictive or not of overall sustainment of our evidence-based practice. The other item measure that I wanted to share with you, which just came out in September, is the Provider Report of Sustainment Scale, or the PRESS. And this was developed by Greg Ahrens and colleagues. And Greg, you will know, has developed a lot of different measures related to implementation science, around implementation leadership specifically, and also some organizational constructs and evidence-based practice um, attitudes, et cetera. So this is the latest in their um, measurement development. So the PRESS, which, I have to say I was even more excited about than the SMSS. So the SMSS is 35 items. It's not impossible. We're only gonna use it three times. I don't think it will be terrible, but what got me really excited about this is this is actually three items. And Aaron's and colleagues was, were very um, focused on how could they create a, a pragmatic sustainment measure. And I appreciate that because, you know, even a 40 item measure, which is the program sustainability assessment tool, even a 35 item measure, which is a sustainment measurement system scale, even those can become cumbersome when you are doing a very pragmatic type of, of research project, which hybrid type threes often are. And so they took the Glasgow and Riley 2013 pragmatic measure criterion, criteria, which you see on the left side, um, in, that, it, that a measure be important to stakeholders that the burden be low for respondents and the staff needing to, um, to request these measures being uh, answered, that, that the results from these need to be actionable and that, that they're also sensitive to change, broadly applicable. Um, they can be used as a benchmark to address or interpret public health goals, 
They won't cause harm. They're psychometrically strong and they're related to a theory or model. So that those are the criteria for what really is needed for a pragmatic measure. And then you can see on the right hand side, the way that the team um, thought about these criteria for pragmatic measurement and put it to use in developing the press. So um, they had a lot of uh, stakeholder involvement um, to make sure that these were things that could be important to stakeholders, that it's freely available, it's easy to score and interpret. They are phrased to be sensitive to change, it can be used across different settings and evidence-based practices. Certainly there's no specific sensitive information collected. They used a lot of psychometri psychometrics in developing it, rash measurement theory, classical test theory, and they relate it, not surprisingly, to the EPIS, the, the framework that Greg Ahrens and colleagues created, the ex exploration, preparation, implementation, and sustainment um, framework. So these are the three items. And so what we've decided is that the sustainment measurement system scale seems to be more about the organization and the setting. So sort of gets at the, the practice setting part of the dynamic sustainability framework. The press is, seems to be more individually based. It's really about the staff within that practice setting. So we decided to use both. And so at the same time at the implementation after each of our implementation strategy wedges, and then at the very end of our program, we will use both the sustainment measurement system scale along with this press measurement. So these three items are staff use the evidence-based practice as much as possible when appropriate, Staff continue to use the evidence-based practice throughout changing circumstances. And the evidence-based practice is a routine part of our practice. This is on a scale of zero um, to not at all. Zero means not at all, four meaning to a great extent. So the measurement is slightly different where the sustainment measurement system scale is one to five, but it's still the same number of items. And so we will use both of them and we'll um, incorporate both the sustainment measurement system scale and the press into our implementation dashboard that I showed you. So we'll be able to look at those over time. I, de I definitely, I didn't wanna act like, <laughs> I sort of mentioned things that suggest that the program sustainability assessment tool, which is what we said we would use in the beginning when we developed our program, that it's bad. And I don't think that it's bad. We've actually been using this to uh, really frame a lot of our stakeholder advisory board meetings, a lot of our stakeholder engagement. At the time that we developed in late 2019, our proposal for our implementation science program, this was the only sustainability measurement tool out there. And so we were excited. This was created by a group at Washington University in St. Louis. For anyone who has a, a sophomore or a junior in high school, the acronym is PSAT. So I don't like to use that acronym, but so it, it, you can use, use this online or you can use this in paper form. You go to the website, which is sustaintool.org and you can um, assess this sustainability over time uh, or online or on paper. And so it's a 40 item self-assessment that program staff and stakeholders can take to evaluate the sustainability capacity of a program, which they define as the ability to maintain programming and its benefits over time. And if you remember what I said earlier is that one of the reasons we moved from this to the sustainment measurement system scale is that we didn't have a global outcomes measure in the program sustainability assessment tool. We either kind of had like a, a, a qual I, I love qualitative research, but we only really had a qualitative measurement of is this evidence-based practice continuing or not continuing? We didn't really have an outcome measure. And now we have that outcome measure in the sustainment measurement system scale. So that's why we went with that. But what we've been doing um, with these 40 items is not so much using them as a measurement tool, but using them to drive how we engage with our stakeholders. So in several projects, a CDC project, a PCORI project, we are taking a few of these items for every meeting and we're talking about um, organizational capacity, we're talking about communication, talking about funding, and we're really using that to have a conversation with our stakeholders about how we can keep something going. And we've been doing this from the beginning in each of these projects so that we're not waiting until the end, that we're definitely using it to plan for sustainability. So you can go to this website um, to actually look at some of the tools that you can use to develop um, sustainability action plans. These are the eight items. Each one of them has five specific questions that are part of the 40 item questionnaire. So environmental support, 
funding stability, partnerships, organizational capacity, program evaluation, program adaptation, communications, and strategic planning. So each one of them has five questions. Again, um, working with a Brown colleague, we just used two of these in a stakeholder advisory board and really just generated a lot of great conversations. The stakeholders didn't actually complete the measures, but really we used this as a way of framing that conversation and, and found that a very helpful and useful way of using the program sustainability assessment tool. This is the kind of paper score you can get on the website um, to sort of think about how um, sort of the things that come up during the conversations if you decide to have it that way, or you can use this to use the survey in its intended way, um, which is to have a number of people complete the survey. And then this is what a plan might look like. You might have a vision statement for how you would like to see your program or your project or your evidence-based practice, um, how you see it being sustained over time. Um, you can think about like current funding sources. You can think about what the results are from either having a conversation about these different sustainability components, or if you did have the survey completed by your stakeholders, what the results were. Um, and think about like what elements you need to actually focus on. So for example, you might find you have a terrific environment support in terms of the internal and external climate for your program, but funding is really going to be a problem. So how can we work with different health systems, with different medical programs to actually include this as a line item in something that you know you can plan for for the future for a budget like that takes a lot of planning. Maybe you have um, you know, great organizational um, capacity, but strategic planning is not something that is really strong in the organizations that you work with. So how can you continue to support that organizational capacity for that evidence-based practice while at the same time really trying to get those organizational leaders involved in a strategic planning process? So those might be places, you know, you might be able to use this to highlight strengths certain sustainability strengths that you currently have, but also then identify potential areas of weakness that you can use this type of plan to start um, thinking more about. So um, this is what uh, um, a plan might look like after you think through some of these issues. You can then have, you know, this, this is using like the SMART goals and, you know, uh, you know, what are the steps we need to achieve our objective? Who does the work? What does success look like? What are the non-financial resources that we need um, to, to help us get there? And you know, getting very specific by the due date in which we really think about it. So these are some really great tools that are on the Program Sustainability Assessment Tool website that um, you could look at and either use it in conjunction with the Program Sustainability Assessment Tool questions, the survey, or perhaps use it with another type of measure. Um, that we've talked about today. So that is really the end of uh, really thinking about how to plan for and assess sustainability. And uh, I'd like to now um, open it up for any questions that you might have. And I see that there are some questions about slides and I'm happy to share them. Um, certainly I'll do that. Uh, I don't know if I'll just do that individually, put them on the Implementation Science Core website or on the advanced CTR, but I'm, I'm happy to, to do that in whatever way um, it's helpful. It'd be great to know if anyone is actually focusing on um, sustainability in any of your work and how if there's any like specific questions you might have to think about that more here. Tommy, did you have a question? Hey, Ronnie, uh, awesome presentation as always. Uh, I did have a quick question. So it sounded like, though maybe I misunderstood, it sounded like a lot of the assessment tools are sort of self-report. So I was kind of curious if there was a role for like independent evaluation or, or observation in assessing sustainability or how you might go about doing that? That's a great, um, that's a great question. No, I mean, 
If there are other sustainment measurement tools out there, I'd love to know about them. The ones that I just presented were the ones that I know about. So if there are other ones, please share that. Um, I'd love to know. But these, yes, are all self-report. It's important to know, I didn't provide background to how the sustainment measurement system scale came about, but it, it is actually really interesting. Larry Palinkas, who um, was a mentor of mine um, and is actually a mentor to Kelly Scott right now and to Hannah Frank. Um, he's an anthropologist, so he does a lot of mixed methods work. And he was actually asked by SAMHSA to create a way of them, SAMHSA, the program office, um, identifying what, were the, what was the likelihood and success of their programs being sustained, which is why it was created in the context of mental health and substance use prevention services. As a result of doing that work, um, which did involve a lot of interviews, a lot of observations, and then the psychometrics for the measure, he actually decided to publish it and make it like available to everyone. So not just um, something that SAMHSA could use, which is why that it's out there now. But he did, um, he, in, um, if you look at his paper, you can see how he took the self-report nature of the sustainment measurement system scale and did actually look at whether or not the program was continuing or not. So not just, so yes, it was a self-report measure, but it was actually linked to objective data as to whether or not the program was continuing. So, so I feel good about using it because it has shown that reliability and validity. Um, I don't know if that will always be the case outside of his SAMHSA evaluation. But we, but I think it's important because that's what happens is that people's, you, you think something is, you think it's been implemented, it's been adopted and oh my gosh, isn't that great? And you think it's going to be sustained. But think about the turnover that happens in organizations. Think about, um, you know, how do you keep that champion in place if that's what you've needed to keep something going? And so how does that, Come, how does that become part of the culture of an organization? And so if we can look at those determinants of sustainability and you know, see where things are strong and where things are not so strong and how we can build those up over time, maybe we have a chance of actually sustaining something in, a, in the longer term. That makes sense. Thanks. Um, I know that Yavanska asked a question about if hybrid threes are the only type of study that is done with a randomized control trial. No, each, each hybrid design is a randomized control trial. So whether it's a hybrid one, which is a more of a traditional randomized, randomized control trial focusing on effectiveness, a hybrid type two, which is a randomized control trial focusing both on effectiveness and implementation strategies, and then the hybrid three. And again, Sarah Becker will present, be presenting this in, in a couple of weeks. So we hope that you'll join us then to hear more about that. And I'm not sure if, um, oh, there's another question. Um, do you have any experience with the clinical sustainability assessment tool by the same people who did the, the program sustainability assessment tool? Seems like this is a useful tool potentially for those of us in clinical settings. I, I don't actually have any um, experience with the CSAT, which I'm, I'm more willing to use that acronym than the PSAT. So the CSAT, um, no, I, I don't know anything about that. And um, if Jack or others want to tell us about it, um, that would be great to hear. I don't really know anything about it, Ronnie. I just went to the website and it was on there and you can choose the PSAT or the, um, the clinical one as an option to look at. So yeah, I'll, I'll do a little digging, but it looks similar, but like yeah. maybe more for a clinical practice type of yeah. things and not so much like programs or, or mm -hmm. maybe not specifically for evidence-based interventions. It would be really interesting to see if the same eight components or are similar to the components of the CSAT or not, but that's great. I'll look at that. Thanks, Jack. Um, and Yvonska has a question of, if, more wondering if you can do a hybrid three using another design besides an RCT. Uh, no, it has to be what well, it has to be a randomized controlled trial design. But the important thing to rem and you'll learn about this in a couple of weeks is that in a hybrid type three, um, you're not randomizing on the intervention; you're randomizing on the strategies. So it's different in that 
everyone's getting the same intervention, but what they're doing is they're getting different strategies. And in our case, because we couldn't really do like a control group, so to speak, that's why we did the stuffed wedge cluster randomized design so that everybody gets everything, but not at the same time. So they serve as their own controls while they are not being delivered that those strategies in that particular wedge. But um, it, that has to do more with like power and things like that. Um, and Sarah Becker, who's going to be giving the presentation in a in a few weeks, um, has uh, talked about interrupted time series. There's some publications, and and maybe she'll bring that into her her talk next week too. Thank you, Sarah, for putting that link in. Um, I see that there's a question from Haley. Um, NIH funding structures timelines pose a challenge for studying sustainability by grant funding. Yes. Do you have any recommendations um, for institutes or mechanisms that are well suited to studying sustainability? Well, definitely the SIHH review group, um, which is the implementation science review group, um, would be thrilled to review something on sustainability because it is such an important topic and you know, there are certain things that are such important topics that, and are really not getting addressed. Um, sustainability is one of them. Um, De-implementation is another. Um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion of measurement in recent years. Um, Kelly Scott's been involved in a lot of measurement. Um, so these are things that are priorities right now. So Sarah Becker is actually on that review group. So maybe she can talk about that um, the next time. And, um, Sorry, I'm not keeping up very well. Jackie, and I see that Sarah just answered your question. Is there a recommended timeline for measuring sustainability? Of course, further out is probably better, but is there a minimum amount of time recommended once implementation efforts stop? Um, and Sarah has responded. This is a reason why she loves the step wedge trials. You first, your first wedge can give follow-up data for years. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, a lot of studies do look at, you know, outcomes maybe 12 months after, but even that is just, that's not really great. And I have to say, that's one of the things that I've loved about being in the VA is that I've been able to have funding for that first thing that I talked about that went from evidence generating to implementation to sustainment is that I was able to have nine years of funding to really explore that over time. And that's really a gift because you know we don't usually get those kinds of things. So somehow either through you know just continuous funding or longer can we actually have those longer term outcomes. It's, it's really hard. We have a PCORI. Uh, I'm working with a team in Pittsburgh on a PCORI DNI project. We've had funding for, um, it initially started as two years, but through supplements has moved to three and a half years. That is actually really interesting because it was a true implementation project. It wasn't even a hybrid trial. There was no randomization. It was a true implementation of evidence-based practice into seven pain clinics and um, definitely gave us a sense of sustainability because it was never even a study. It was more of just a true QI implementation effort. Um, but even three and a half years isn't great. And we were just talking because the project is due to end in January about how how can we sort of at least through the electronic medical record keep an eye on certain indicate certain sustainability indicators that we think will be able to tell us whether something will continue or not and and also about strategies we, we can do now to build things into the culture of the clinic so that when people leave when there's turnover um, no one really forgets even if it's just like a yearly check-in or something but something I think to leave people alone completely will be really hard um, I, I it would be hard to to think that they would sustain something at all so I know it's 11 o'clock um I think we have a slide here thank you Iman um, we have another uh, session next week. I'm really excited to introduce you to Dr. Jennifer Sullivan, who is a new Brown uh, School of Public Health faculty member. And um, we'll be talking about implementation strategies within the context of a project that she's been doing. So really hope to see you again in a week at the same time. And uh, if you have any 
questions, uh, do feel free to email me and be happy to um, answer anything offline. And thanks to everyone who asked questions and to, and to others, Sarah, for responding. Really appreciate it. Thank you.